So we're going to kick it off. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. This is a great crowd. We, you know, we've been doing this for 13 years now. And, um, uh, sometimes we're 20, sometimes we're 70, but it's wonderful to have all you part of this community. Uh, very privileged to have Callan Page, uh, Principal Lesson at Microsoft S. Uh, as our presenter tonight. And as usual, I will leave that uh, detail of uh, your background to you. And then at the end, we have a, a door prize. And you're the person who's the door prize. You're, no, you're the person who gets to pick the name out of the hat. So did everybody get a chance to put their name? No. No. No one can do that downstairs? No. Is the basket downstairs? Yeah, maybe we should pass the basket. I'll take oh, a bribe. So <laughs> <laughs> they can put their name in more than once. I'll go get the basket. You know, testers that challenge the system. We are his friend. Yeah. So, Alan Page, we'll be like, you know, lounge time with Alan. I'm Alan, and thanks for having me. Happy to be here. What can I tell you? I should tell you about myself. I work at Microsoft. Um, I've been there for coming up on 18 years, approaching my 20th year of testing. Um, should I start from the end and go backward? No, that's too hard. I'm gonna go from the beginning and go forward. <laughs> Almost 20 years ago, I uh, started testing software. Well, I took a job to do tech support at a company that made music software. And on the first day, they told me, oh, by the way, you're also our software tester. <laughs> I said, okay, great. Then a couple hours later, they said, oh, and you're also our network administrator, sorry. I said, great, I've been using the network for a couple hours, I can figure this out. <laughs> um, so, does anybody remember when you had to buy a sound card separately for your computer? Yeah. Did it come with some really crummy music software? <laughs> I tested it. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for a company called MidiSoft out of Redmond, and they did a lot of OEM, OEM sales of uh, their software. Um, after about a year and a half there, weird things started to happen, and I didn't want to be part of them, so I started looking for jobs. Got a contract job at Microsoft. Uh, working on the Windows 95 team, was hired full time after about six months. Since then, I've worked on a couple of versions of IE, IE 2 and 3. Worked on Windows 9X more, where I met Niels, who's here tonight. Um, from there, I went. Windows 98 was maybe the last version of Windows ever, so the team disbanded. And I went and worked on. Windows 2000, which was uh, called NT5 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, worked there for about six months, and then marketing said, oh my gosh, we need to do another version of Windows, so we did Windows Marketing Edition, Windows ME. <laughs> 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 yes. True. Uh, from there, what do they do? Well, I went and worked on Windows CE for about five years, and I went and worked in a group called Engineering Excellence, which does internal training and a little bit of consulting for about five years. Went and worked at Office Link, which is uh, like Skype but for corporations, but now we bought Skype, so now Skype's like Link, and it's really amazing. <laughs> um, and then I've been at Xbox for about the last year, almost a year and a half now. It's, it's uh, a ton of fun working on the console team there. So, how many of you guys have an Xbox? Oh, I won't give any away tonight. Then. <laughs> I, I Mine's that. broken though. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's broken. Red ring of death. I didn't bring any. I didn't bring any video away. So that's kind of it. Um, the good news is, is it's a small screen. And you can't see my head through it. I don't have a lot of um, words on my slides, <coughs> which is for a couple reasons. One is I don't know very many words. Another one is that um, I don't like. Uh, I'm not very good at giving the same talk twice, I'll screw it up. So this is a variation of a talk I gave at Eurostar, um, when was that, November? Yeah. And so I've changed the round a little, and because I don't have any bullet points to go by, it'll probably be a whole new talk, so we'll see what happens. Was anybody at Eurostar? So I don't have to disappoint you, buddy. You should be in good shape, all right, good. Um, if you want, if you have a question, you can interrupt me. The talk is so ad hoc, I can't get thrown off my rocker here. I, I don't force you to wait questions till the end. We can go as fast or as slow as you want. I'm gonna talk about some things I've learned about test innovation, a bunch of like things I've read, and those kinds of things, and, and hopefully uh, you leave here with some ideas. So I talked a little bit about where this came from. This is from, uh, again, just throw beer at me if I 
um, free pizza if you need to have any questions. So this came from a talk I gave uh, at Eurostar. And where that talk came from was I'd been uh, blogging uh, a couple years ago, and I've had this uh, worry about where, like, new ideas in testing. Where are the new ideas in testing come from? And uh, there's an example here. So here are some uh, talks from a conference. Um, let me know if any of these look interesting, like something you want can't to go to. Them. Oh, you can't see? I'm going to read them to you. Can't see you better on the back side. Back over here. Well, I still see on the camera? Yeah, you're fine. Not okay? Well, okay. So the, the art and science of load testing internet applications, very relevant. Model-based testing, test management, user acceptance tests. Not bad, huh? Pretty good lineup? Well, these are all from a talk, a star conference in 2000. And so my, as I look at these, I think, wow. It's not like they aren't new perspectives. And I'm not making fun of these people for not having brand new ideas. But, um, I wonder why we don't have more, uh, and, I'll, and I'll get to the answer eventually here tonight. We'll, we'll explore it together. But I wonder why there aren't more like, oh wow, I've never thought of that before kind of things these come out of these conferences. And I picked on that conference because there were a lot of talks there, but it's kind of what I was seeing over the years. Um, so then I started thinking some more. And I'm gonna quote Stephen Johnson a lot. You guys know who Stephen Johnson, the author is? So I'm going to throw out authors and books on there. I'll have pictures of the books so you can grab them. The slides are posted online. Uh, Stephen Johnson wrote, uh, he's written a book since then. The, one of his latest books is called Where Good Ideas Come From. And I've stolen a lot of ideas from that book. <laughs> Which I will share with you and present as my own because you haven't read it. <laughs> so I was thinking about innovation and testers, and it's, it's just bugging me. You know you get just Another concept from uh, Stephen Johnson called the slow hunch. Like a lot of ideas come from, is it like all of a sudden I have this idea? It's like, I need to let things brew for a while. You guys do this at work, like, I don't know what, there's something here. Something, spidey sense is tingling. I gotta figure this out, but I don't know the answer yet. I'm just gonna let it brew for a while. So, I figured out what bugged me. And what bugged me is, if there is a field of uh, what, do we, what do we do, what do we call it? Field of art, science, whatever I call it, what we do. If there's a field of knowledge work where innovation should happen, I think it would be from testers. Because you look at, um, I'll read this to you. I know quite certain this is from, you guys know who that is? <laughs> Albert. <laughs> yeah, Cousin Albert. I know quite certain that I myself have no special talent, curiosity, obsession, and dogged endurance combined with self-criticism have brought me to my ideas. No special talent, I got that. Curiosity, obsession, endurance. I have all those things. I'm Einstein. <laughs> and then I had another weird, yeah. But these are testers. This isn't just me. The good testers I know, this describes them. And when you think of, I, I don't think you can think of Einstein not thinking of innovation, or at least smartness and get, figuring out cool things. So there is hope we can get somewhere. So when I think about innovation, Guys, it's, uh, there are people much smarter than me, much more experienced than me, that have done a ton of work in innovation. There's places like um, IDEO that do just really cool stuff. I am not an expert in innovation, but I think about it a lot. So I'm gonna share what I know. And when I think about innovation, it's ideas. So test innovation is what? Test, test ideas. ideas, yeah. Interaction. We're going to figure out where this goes. <laughs> so let's talk about ideas. Um, where do ideas come from? From the mind. From the mind? From the mind. In the shower. I'll tell you what John Cleese says. In the shower, yes. And I'll, I'll talk about why that happens. We don't know where we get ideas from. What we do know is that we do not get them from our laptops. <laughs> it's good to know. I don't normally read slides, but you can see them in the back there. Um, so they come from the shower. Why do they come in the shower? You're not thinking about it at the time. Um, you're not sometimes, thinking, yeah. You're not, you can't take a shower and test. <laughs> 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 <It's trying. laughs> That's what you're testing. <laughs> you're yeah. only showering when you're showering. Don't you? I have this. Um, this is the kind of talk this is going to be. I have this shower with the uh, the multi you know, different streams. And I got a test to figure out which one is most pleasing. 
which you know, and then the angle, it's also on this a shower kind of like you know, it isn't always perfect, kind of adjust it and figure out, you know, and I and testing is learning, so I'm learning what things work to hold this in place, which one is better for the morning shower, because generally I'm just lazy, you know, and we stick in the uh, the non-innovative pattern, I'll just do way, do things the way I've always done them, so I'll leave the shower on the normal setting. But really, if I was gonna do this right, I would have a different setting for like the after soccer game versus the morning shower. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's you can do some testing in there. There's a little bit of a stretch when they come on to something. <laughs> so ideas come from other ideas. This is a big uh, a big point that Steven Johnson makes in his, his book Where Ideas Come From. In fact, he uh, there's the, when the lightning happened in England, um, when, the, when people were, all of a sudden these great ideas started coming out, kind of spawning the Renaissance in Europe. Uh, two things happened. Um, one, they opened these coffee shops where people got together and talked and shared ideas. Other thing was, instead of drinking, because they couldn't drink the water as, you know, without being like boiled and made into coffee, so they either, before then, they're just drinking alcohol all day. <coughs> and had no place to hang out. And then when they started actually drinking coffee and getting together, all these ideas started coming out, which is, yeah, that makes sense. So that's what we should do as testers. Less of the beer, more coffee. <laughs> um, yeah. It's more getting together and talking. <laughs> it is, and, and that is the most important thing. So the, the challenge is, this talk is for everyone not in this room. It really is, because you guys have already figured out that ideas come from other ideas, you came here to get ideas, to combine with what you already know, so you can go, oh yeah, I get, I have a new, something new to try. But the people that, the thing is, you already know that because you're here, I'm in a weird sort of place. Um, uh, Philip Armour talks about the five orders of ignorance, and if you've ever seen me talk before, I can hardly ever not talk about Philip. Uh, it's, I'll, I'll do it short this time. You, it's, you know what you know, you know what you don't know, then you don't know what you don't know, and then you don't have a suitable means to discover what you don't know you don't know. <laughs> Tester in the room? That's four. That's four, thank you, Kevin. Fifth one is, is you know about the five words of ignorance. <laughs> so, uh, you came here to discover, hopefully, maybe not too much of it, we'll see how the night goes, but to discover what you don't know you don't know. So you can connect that. And, so. Once you discover what you don't know you don't know, you can learn it if you want to or need to, then it becomes something you know you don't know, that happens immediately, then it becomes something you know that's part of your language. That's how, interesting, that's how knowledge acquisition works, and that's how testing works. I wonder what's gonna happen in this application when I, you know, input this text field with a bunch of numbers, typical tester kind of mind thing. You don't know, then you know what you know, and then you, that's a test design technique you've learned to use over time. How did you learn to test? Uh, again, all over the board, the slides are here to keep you from going too far off, but feel free to reel me in if you want. Um, I'll pick on you. How did you learn to test? Are you I had to do support. Yes. I had to do support. <laughs> and now you guys will figure out once this thing is shipped, gosh, what, what the heck's going on with this and how, how could they have perhaps uh, missed this? Yeah, and I, was, I started right with um, here, test this. Um, okay. And it, you kind of figure out what works and doesn't work as you go. So it applies there. So, slides really me in. Stephen Johnson talks about um, this thing called the adjacent possible. And this is uh, any new idea is, but the good new ideas are not flying cars. We have some steps in between. <coughs> it's something that's so close to what's already possible, it's just it's like, oh yeah, why didn't I think of that kind of thing? Going to flying cars is a jump. Putting a rear view camera in my car is genius. <laughs> and, and again, some things uh, depend on not only the thought of doing that, but you know, cost factors, et cetera. There's a lot of those little things that you go, oh my God, why didn't I think of that? And you see this, um, uh, gosh, every day. Uh, the story I've, I haven't told in a long time, so I'll tell it now. Is I have a Toyota Prius. I think a lot of cars do this now. I didn't bought the new car. I bought it, my first car in 20 years, I think. Anyway, so I bought this car, and I used to lock my keys in the car all the time. I cannot, it's impossible to lock your keys inside of a Prius. It was made for me. I thought, that's genius. It's the adjacent pot. It's like, 
Well, we can have proximity, we can make this, we can make it so you can't block a key in the cards. Not jumping all the way to flying car, but doing something innovative that makes me happy. I like that. So ideas connecting other ideas. Let's figure out uh, some more about those. Uh, this is a real thing I got from Kickstarter. This is called the ostrich pillow. <laughs> you see that all right? This is dangerous moving around with that big cable there. Am I still on the camera over here? Yeah, you're fine. This is a better spot for me? You're good. So, um, <laughs> I think I kind of want one, but then I worry if my drool get all over the inside. <laughs> but still, someone's, this is an example of the adjacent possible. Somebody's either napping in the library or trying to get, you guys went to, some of you went to college, right? <laughs> yeah. To nap. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of good things about this. One, it's soft. I'll try and wedge my coat under there. It's obvious that I'm sleeping. No one will come bug me. And if I'm hung over, it shields out some of the noise. <laughs> so there's a lot of good things about this. I don't know if it's really going to catch on. Um, I think I may go uh, walk through the library over at the U someday to see how many of this floating around. Um, but there's something there. So um, example of, you can call it innovation. So how do you guys innovate? Anybody? Well, of course. You go, you say, let's go innovate, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then you spend some time doing that, and then you're done. No. <laughs> really? Do you, do your, does your manager ever say you should be more innovative? Really? Do you? I, I try to explain what I do to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> it always gets me down to the basics. It's the rubber plant effect. Yeah. Well, you know, what's the, what's the Arthur Clark quote? Uh, any. Uh, help, help me out here. <laughs> <laughs> this is magic. Yeah. So, so to uh, a lot of people in our lives, what we do is magic. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool, huh? So, you figure that doesn't work that way. No. It's more of what happens if I try this. That'll get you there. But where does innovation, a lot of it, to me, where it comes from is not let's go innovate, but let's solve the problem. You take a step back from there. Let's figure out if I have a problem. Um, going back to where I started, I think a lot of innovation, you know, it's like five degrees colder on this side of the table than that side of the table, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna power through it for you. It's gonna keep my beer cold all the way through the top, though, so it'll be all right. Um, a lot of failures in innovation, I think, happen because people are happy with the status quo. They're not happy with trying something new. Like, you know, maybe the way we were doing things isn't so good. Yeah. I would argue a lot of innovation comes when you're hitting your head against walls and you at some point say, hey, this hurts. But <laughs> 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 a lot of people bang their head against the wall and go, this is my job. I bang my head against the wall. I'm good at it. We've always done it this way. <laughs> yeah. We've always done it this way is the death of innovation. Mm -hmm. It's the most dangerous phrase in the human language, according to Grace Hopper. But how, yeah. but how many times do we hear that? How many times do we see... Um, hopefully not ourselves, but our colleagues who don't come to things like this to try to learn new things, say that. Mm -hmm. Often, too often. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, the job of an innovator, a lot of times, and again, I'm, for those who just walked in, I don't claim to be an innovator. I claim to have read a lot about it, so mm -hmm. we'll go from there. Um, I think the job of an innovator is to recognize when those things go on and ask, is, is there a better way? And Often the better way comes from that adjacent possible, from connecting the ideas that are close to the idea at hand and get these eureka moments to happen. So I mentioned before you uh, say the solve problem, what problem do we need to solve? How can we solve the problem? All right. Well, we can answer our phones. <laughs> um, so there are more than two kinds of problems. I'm not. I'm not making a dichotomy here. I'm going to talk about two kinds of problems. First kind of problem is we know we have a problem. Our test pass rates suck. We can't do this. We, don't have, we haven't had a good build in four weeks. We, know, we kind of know what the problem is, and maybe the root cause is a little more complex than that. And don't worry, this picture is going somewhere. <laughs> uh, there's a problem we know we have, and maybe we, need, we know it needs a solution, and maybe it needs an innovative solution. A friend of mine at work was going on a trip to France. Two days before the trip, maybe it was like the Friday before and he was leaving on Monday or Tuesday, plenty of time. He realized, 
oh wow, I bought a, I put my passport in a safe in my garage. It's a safe I bought at a garage sale. This guy knows he's, he has a garage full of everything but his cars. Um, and he had put it in his garage and thought, I'll keep my, my passport out there and some valuables because I have a safe. Well, why not? Uh, he didn't know the combination to his safe. <laughs> he forgot. And he figured, well, on Monday I can call and have someone come, you know, drill this out or whatever. It wasn't like a, you know, the safe in the movies that blows up if you try and crack it. It was just, it was a, you know, but a fairly robust safe. A couple ways to solve that. One, me, lazy, no innovation involved. I would, maybe I won't call this innovation. Maybe I'll just call it invention. I would just wait till Monday, maybe over the weekend, try and get someone to come drill the safe out, try and figure out what to do. Uh, maybe look around and see if I can figure out where I hid, hid the, uh, combination, figure out if, you know, maybe did I send it to something like my birthday? I don't know. Um, I don't know. But he, did, he built a robot to brute force crack the safe. I have a video of it that I promise not to show. You know, I find it and go to the safe manufacturer yeah, and, and look up the default combination. <laughs> yeah, that's actually very good. And in fact, I, give, I end up giving this statement at every single talk I give, but if as a tester you haven't read the works of Richard Feynman, go do so. He is, he wasn't, he never was a software tester, but he is, you know, a, he would have been fantastic. He had the curiosity and the drive, he knew how to social debug things. Like he said, he will, um, uh, there's stories of learning how to crack safes and how to figure out, go through, you know, birthdays and things, and then learning the default combinations <laughs> people never change. <laughs> you know you get right, you know you do it, you never change it. So um, he built, and shows this video, and it's great, it goes, it's just a three number combination, maybe a four number combination, but brute force them, he figured out how long it would take, set up a camera, because you don't want to watch this thing the whole time, and it would not only turn the knob and, and stop, and then another little arm would come down and try the handle. And the <laughs> program would stop when it got there, chunk. Um, incredible. Did you find the combination? It did. Yeah, I got his passport, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, the reason he doesn't want me to show the video is because it could actually, not the real good safes, because they lock down if you try and go <coughs> too many times, but there are a lot of safes you could actually crack with this uh, today. Would he use a Lego robot or something? Um, I think it was, it was Scott Wadsworth. It was way beyond. Uh, <coughs> if, if you know Scott, yeah. Um, uh, it was probably much more involved. Uh, but anyway, he knew he had a problem. He came up with an inventive way to solve it. Um, interesting guy. He could have started a whole new career. <laughs> he was smart enough to not roll up and not smart enough to make a note of the password? <laughs> <laughs> Why does that surprise Imagine you have to, uh, she was recorded. You uh, <laughs> have to never put something, something somewhere safe. And then had to find it later. Scott reminds me of someone who will grow into an old professor. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> and there's problems we don't know yet. Um, uh, microwave up. Middle of the story of the microwave. You got the candy bar? Candy bar. Remember it? Uh, the guy's working on. Shoot, you know what? I'm so unprepared. I forgot he was working on something with radio waves. Radar, radar, right? Magnetron. Magnetron, right. And he knows his candy bar was melting. So there's two, um, he goes, wait a minute. What if anything else is melting? No. Um, he's trying to figure out what was going on. And figured out, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, i got to make a microwave five minutes later, he's done. But it's like, we can do something with this with cooking. And there's two interesting aspects of innovation that happen in this story. One is that what he invented, you'll find all, there's tons of stories around what you're actually, what you actually invented that was useful wasn't what you were trying to invent. Uh, this is one example, now I'll give you another one in a minute. But the interesting thing here is that nobody knew, you know, if you were to ask the housewife in the 1950s, um, if you could have one device to make your kitchen life more productive, what would it be? None of them would have said, a way to cook my food faster. This wasn't the, the anything they thought of. It's like, you know, I don't want um, you know, an electric, electric knife. They're great, I love those. So this was so far outside of what they were thinking. I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. Um, plenty of stories like this. Uh, 
let's talk about, and I, people freak out because this is Microsoft guys, let's talk about the iPhone. Let's talk about the iPhone for a second. How many of you have an iPhone? Don't answer. Because <laughs> I know it's probably all of you. <laughs> Except for me, I'm a Windows phone. My wife has an iPhone. <laughs> you know why my wife has an iPhone? Because, you know, any, look, where she used to be a tester. Any testers find bugs in their software? If I give her one of these, oh, and she yeah. finds bugs, she's going to complain to me. If, she, if I give her an iPhone, she's just going to complain to you know, somebody else. That's better for me. <laughs> <laughs> I need to remember I'm being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, how many of you have uh, like non-tech friends that have, have an iPhone and they love it, don't they? How many? Of, yeah, well, just all these great things except make phone calls. Um, or like control. <laughs> okay, fine. We won't make fun. But what the iPhone did was it made people want to have a smartphone. Before the iPhone came out, smartphone, I mean, they were for business people to keep in touch with their work. You know, no, they're not. They're for playing games and keeping yourself busy in line. <laughs> I, went to, I was at Disneyland a, a few weeks ago, and like hundreds of people in line, every single person staring at an iPhone. <laughs> and now we have something to do. So it's, it's really smart. Nobody knew they wanted an iPhone before the iPhone kind of came and the marketplace and just well done. I saw two teenagers on a trampoline yesterday. And they were both playing, both playing with their iPhones. <laughs> this is the kind of shit you take phone. pictures of. <laughs> <laughs> You just take it two ways and come up, came up with an innovation. Yep. You can do a game that's on a trampoline. Uh -huh. There's yeah. something there. That would be cool. Well, and that was just $5 each. Yeah. How cool <laughs> big is your market, though? <laughs> <laughs> How many no, no, no. Look, millions, millions of iPhone users, you sell, you know, sell this thing. Figure out your price point. Yeah. You can make some money. There is something there. Use it for elevators. <laughs> all right. Um, this is the point in the talk where I go, hey, I haven't talked about testing at all. I go, oh, gosh, that's what I'm here for. So now I'll talk about some stuff that I like to pretend I know. Um, remember that we were talking a while ago about we've always done things this way, how cool that is. And how, yeah. So let's talk about a couple things. How many of you measure uh, code coverage? Keep the awesome, isn't it? You do all kinds of great things. Tells you how great and high quality your product is. <laughs> no. Not if you can't trust the test. Sarcasm. <laughs> um, here I have three components with some coverage. I'm not going to talk about what that means because really it doesn't mean much at all. Um, when you have, like for FizzBuzz, I have 81% code coverage. What does that tell me? You touched it. 81% that, that only 19% of my code is completely untested. That's all I know. I'd even say testing. Doesn't it crash. touch the code without testing it? Yeah. No, I'm all, the only, no, you write too much to what I said. The only thing you know from that 81% is that there is 19% of the code that I did not touch at all. Of that 81%, we don't I don't know. know. Yeah. yeah. So. I can yeah. get 100% code coverage and not have a single assert statement. Sure. In oh, all kinds of bad things can happen. <laughs> so we know this, right? So stop equating, and I know none of you do it because you're all smart. Good it's for the people that aren't here, tell them to do it all. Back to work. That uh, don't equate that number to, to quality. It doesn't mean anything. You can, it's a great uh, quote that I can't remember, but I say something often about how Code coverage is a horrible metric, but a nice tool. And it's great for discovering untested code. It's like, I want to look at that 19%, see if it's anything I care about. Maybe there's some that is, maybe not, but I know nothing about that 81%. So how else can we use code coverage? Um, it's a test design, test design tool, I'll give it that. You um, can find unused code. You can find unused code, it's good. 
Something we do often at Microsoft is uh, test selection. I track which, you can't, I'll just explain it. Slide, the slide is candy. Uh, if I know which tests hit which parts of the code, and then I can track which code changes, at least I know which tests hit that code, I can use it for one heuristic for test prioritization. Right now, we use this stupid stuff like, and, and, and maybe you don't know it's stupid yet, but I'm going to tell you this. You have, you have your pry zero test cases, and your pry ones, and your pry twos. You don't know. No. Nope. You're making it up. <laughs> <laughs> this heating system is going to it's age me. Now it's warm and humid. Uh, <laughs> do you want me to turn down? No, no, it's cool. I'm good. I can go up. Yeah. Just watch, watch me falter here. I just want to frost over. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's not perfect, but it's a better way, to, it's, I think, a more effective way to use that data if you can break down what tests are hitting which code. Then I know, okay, this code changed, I can monitor for that. Then I know I have these tests that hit this code. At least I'll run those first, I can find those, those uh, regressions quicker. And it's, those are, to me, on that day, for that moment in time, those are my private one test cases. Or price zero if you must be zero based. I was on a team once um, a long time ago that I won't name, but they made something similar to this um, who actually had pry negative one test cases because pry zero wasn't enough. <laughs> 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 oh my god. No! no. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to talk, talk about some more dumb stuff. Um, you guys love your test pass rates? No. 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 See, it's for your friends who aren't here. <laughs> So you have a bunch of tests and you run them and you have this test pass rate and once it gets to um, some percentage you're ready to ship, right? No. Nope. No? Gosh, you're ruining all my fun. <laughs> um, 90, 95, 98, 100% pass rate. That's only for the nope. tests that you bothered to write down. Or the tests that you disabled. <laughs> 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 All the things that you thought about the test mm -hmm. are passing, and assuming your tests are right. Do you have like a ship criteria of like a 100% pass rate? Anybody have that? Yeah. So you disable the tests that are failing. So you <laughs> yeah. 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 Sometimes other people you tell you to right just don't run those tests. tests. Yeah. You know why we measure test pass rate? I, actually, be honest. How many of you measure test pass rate? Used to. It has to be 100%. So useful. It's, oh, it's, it's a great thing to go beat up developers with when the numbers are low. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> Over time, yeah, like, yeah, the test passed, this test hasn't passed in you know, three years. Um, I don't know. Uh, I like to worry less about what that number is. And again, trends are great. And don't put all your eggs in that basket. And again, you guys are also going to figure this out. Um, what I've found is a useful way to look at this is, um, here's just an example, this is reporting made in PowerPoint, quickly, <laughs> is <laughs> tracking trends per test. Like this test has, I can find flaky tests. Do you guys ever have any flaky tests? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> like, you want to be able to find those. Can I trust this test? I have a concept okay. um, of test trustworthiness. Great. You're like, when this test, you know, False positives suck, right? And they're a pain in the butt. If you lose credibility around this test, and it failed, but the, it's actually the product's OK. It was my fault. And, and over time, there's credibility there. Uh, how many of you do not have any false positives in your test testing? OK. And thank you for being honest. Again, this is your, your, your friends at home will go, oh, me. Um, I would argue that if you have tests that are failing when they should be passing, that you have tests that are passing that probably should be failing. So you need to put the same effort in all your tests. You can kind of track, uh, I hate to do this per person, so I, I, I wouldn't do that. But kind of in a feature area, you can find areas of the product where test flakiness may be more prevalent. Um, yeah, especially uh, where the ones that pass when the product's not installed. Yeah, you've heard that story. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people. <laughs> I, I read one once of a uh, yeah, test, pa uh, somebody ran their test suite and it passed like 70% of the lab was offline. 20%. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, defect injection is a good topic to bring up with that. Yeah. Yeah. Solve oh, the product with right. some known failure. And, 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 and,
And how, does your test, how does your test suite? They, uh, does the it find all of right, The textbooks call it mutation testing. Yes. <laughs> well, I'll mutate the code and find out how good your tests really are. Um, I like my turn button. Yeah. Well, you know, I just memorize it in Wikipedia like everyone else. <laughs> all right. Well, who, before it was it you back, you're going to ask me about talking about crowdsourcing? I cannot talk about testing without talking about crowdsourcing. Let me give you an example from the great product known as Windows Vista. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, Windows Vista, again, I'm on camera, but I'm on a roll now. Um, <laughs> Vista was great. You know why? Because I worked on Windows Millennium, and I, had, I needed to kind of live out of it. <laughs> Nobody talks about Windows Marketing Edition anymore. <laughs> All right, here's a problem in testing. Anybody do localization testing? You probably do globalization testing, but actually test uh, fluent in the language and test the localization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's a little hard. Mm -hmm. so generally, you outsource this to in-country testing. It's very expensive and complex. You figure how to get, you either have to give them an exact script to follow, which is no fun, or send them screenshots, which is less fun. <laughs> and so a lot of these things never get fixed. And in this example, I will, for those of you without supersonic vision, I'll give you an example of localization bug. Um, in uh, Polish, we uh, localize suspend and hibernate as the exact same word. Mm -hmm. Common localization problem, right? You, just, you have a, a two words that kind of mean the same when, when you go the language. It's the, the nuance is lost because they just get a string and they don't realize it should be two different things. Something like this typically would never get fixed because never get found until too late. They go, ah, whatever, people will figure it out. The tool tip's different. People are smart. <laughs> right? So uh, what a colleague of mine did at work was combined, um, there's this book, uh, gosh, pushing 10 years old now, Wisdom of Crowds. Mm -hmm. this is, um, and anybody read it? The guys need to read more. That's where ideas come from. There's way, more, way better <coughs> books than from me. Or so, listen to it while you're uh, doing the boring test pass. A lot of these are on books. <laughs> So wisdom of crowds, uh, you, you guys have heard of crowdsourcing. I'm not going to go deeply into it, but they found that like the uh, one of the opening stories is the guess how many marbles are in the jar. Thing. Um, it's hard to guess, but if you get like 50 people to guess, their average answer is pretty close to accurate. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So wisdom of crowds, localization problem. Here's my uh, this is my that's my gamer. Does it look like look like me? I gave my, my profile pretty close. I have way more gamer points than that now, just FYI. <laughs> so people like games, too. Um, one of the things about Xbox is uh, the idea of the gamer score. People will do the stupidest things in games to get these points that mean nothing. <laughs> really, and there are, game, there, are, there are game point farmers, which we have people to crack down on. Like you can like lend your ID and password to someone who will go, you know, find the easiest, he has all the games, he gets the easiest achievements, and all of a sudden you have points. Because like, whatever. <laughs> so let's all these three ideas, and, and let's let the adjacent possible from Stephen Johnson kind of guide us into um, what uh, my friend Ross at Microsoft calls the language quality game. We gave people, um, well, I'll back up. We made a game. Not a complex game, no, no blood, no fast cars, no nothing. Um, all it had was a, a Windows, a, a web app with a dialogue, and you could drag it to the red side for something's wrong, or the green side for something's good. Um, put screenshots in there from all over Windows, um, localized into, I don't know, 20, 30 languages. Windows sim ships like in a ton of different languages. Um, rather than go pay those in country, because I don't want to pay people. Um, rather than go pay those in-country testers to go figure out what, uh, you know, uh, you know, what go through the screens one by one by one by one. We had the game. Microsoft is a big company. One of the things to say about Microsoft is the key to our success is we will leverage our size as a competitive advantage. We don't do that enough. We let it get in our way. You see the orange chart picture? <laughs> yeah, amazingly accurate. I'm sorry. <coughs> so, um, we have like subs like. Finnish speakers at Microsoft, German speakers, um, you know, every language in the world. Found those aliases, 
put a ball in the two line, send a link to the game, said, here, play this game. And they did. Because, and the only gripe against this game about, well, they should be doing their work, is that they would have been playing Solitaire Minesweeper. <laughs> Come on. So that was it. That was the marketing for the game. We sent it out to all these people, and we had uh, about a half a million screens reviewed. Again, crowdsourcing, some of the screens get reviewed more than you know, several times. People look at them, drag them around. And we thought about, should we give them latte coupons? Big thing at Microsoft, big giveaway, a $5 latte coupon. Should we give them a free copy of Windows, Vista? No. <laughs> 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 Give them an iPhone. We gave them an iPhone, no, cool. So we gave them nothing. Actually, I lied. We didn't give them nothing. After they had reviewed like 25 screens, they would get a different color highlighter. <laughs> and then like a hundred another one, just following your basic game design. And people got excited about it. They go, hey, do you get the blue highlighter? No, I have to get the blue highlighter. <laughs> 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 screens. <laughs> so um, about 4,500 people played this game where they got nothing. <laughs> Highlighters. <laughs> that only work in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual. But like also, if you play this, we'll give you free soda. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's my joke because, you know, we get free soda. <laughs> um, we found 5,000 bucks. Uh, just under 500, about 4,800 and some. Um, I would say 90% of those wouldn't have gotten fixed if we didn't buy them, if we didn't ship them. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty good win for free. So now we're going, hey, how can we use games in other ways? We're starting to use, uh, uh, I just in fashion with this gamer score thing, I work on a team that, uh, you know, with my mere 10,000 gamer points, people call me a noob and a rookie. Um, I, people with 100,000 gamer points. We're working on actually incorporating gamer score sort of things <coughs> into our, the things we value on our test team. Like, you know, um, finding a certain number of, of really cool bugs, uh, finding a bug in a certain developer's code who hasn't had who, it, who seriously makes like three bugs a year. <laughs> uh, trying to figure out how we can and, and kind of reward the things we want to have as an organization, helping each other. We have this kudos tool internally that we can say, this person really helped me out. So we give people an achievement when they get five kudos or when they've given kudos. So it encourages them to kind of acknowledge when people help them. One of the things we value on our team is helping others. We have a way to kind of give people an achievement for that, kind of get what we want. It's pretty cool. So, some examples of innovation. What happens when you try and innovate? Come up with new ideas? You get more ideas. No, you, well, you fail. You screw it up. Yeah. Yep. Screw it up is okay, right? You know that because you're here. Yes? I was going to ask, isn't the first example you gave, isn't the real bug that you have a hybrid and a suspend? <coughs> You have two functions that essentially do the same thing as far as the well, answer is concerned. Well, <laughs> no, one is a lot slower. <laughs> That's a bug. <above. laughs> um, it should say, and the problem is, is there isn't a short way to say, do you want to have your computer act like it's off but, but still consume power and come back quicker? Or do you want to take a really long time and really be off and not use any power? But those are hard to abbreviate. <laughs> so yeah, you could say that there's, um, I will not stand up here and claim there are no usability bugs in Windows. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Not my job. <laughs> I know. What are they going to do? Because um, if they fire me, core devs hiring, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if, and I'm not going to go into the big cliche, you got to fail to do stuff right, but you know why Google Maps is so great? Fail now. Because they make failures like this. <laughs> <laughs> I say that just, just, it's just so cool. It's like directions for Superman. <laughs> <laughs> to the Fortress of Solitude. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. But if I may indulge you and dive into the cliche, <coughs> the cliche for a moment, um, Edison, as you know, you've heard the story, made a ton of mistakes making a light bulb. 
try this this one, this this one, this this one. <coughs> and when somebody asked him, and I'm, I paraphrase the hell out of all my stories, don't, mm -hmm. you know, you're all mad at me. Um, when somebody asked him, uh, were you discouraged by it? He goes, no, I found, I, I now know a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. And this is where, going back to the Einstein quote, having, you know, dogged endurance. You know, we try things, they don't work, we try something else. But you learn something from that. And that's really important. You've got to learn to go along. I had to write this little utility that runs as part of every each one of our automated tasks. And it needs to do something pretty much has never been done before, but it wasn't, shouldn't have been that hard. I, you know, I'm not, I'm a good programmer, not a great programmer. It was probably the biggest struggle I've ever had trying to get that to work. I almost gave up and tried to call in someone else to do the work, you know, a dozen, a couple dozen times. But I learned so much about how that part of the subsystem works and, and, and why it did and why it didn't work that it's knowledge I never would have gotten otherwise. Now I can take that knowledge and it'll, it'll be there. Um, I'll take that knowledge and I'll use it in something else, somewhere else. Sometime I'll, I'll link that with some other idea and get something else to happen. A big part of my job, um, kind of, I just had my, my mid year one on one manager like before I came here. So, um, yeah, maybe I am getting fired. Um, but anyway, uh, we're talking about my role is kind of a, I, not just the hole filler, but identify the holes and fill them. Um, I'm good, at, I'm a tester, I'm good at identifying holes. And I fill them by uh, often using my network. One of the first things I did on the team was, um, uh, trying to get into too many details, um, I had to port this tool um, and make it work. I, I can do that. I go, oh shit, this is hard. People tell me, well, this, this doesn't work. I thought, I know, I worked with a guy 12 years ago who doesn't work on this anymore, but he did for a while. Let me email. <laughs> the network, knowing people, is so powerful. You know, if you email some random person, they go, huh, whatever, I'll get to it when I get to it. Here's probably like in five minutes, let me know, oh, you just do this and this. I have direction, the network. Really help me out. All right, back on track. Testing, innovate, yeah, we're talking about innovation. I do have a loose structure here. Um, I kind of gave this away earlier, but um, innovation isn't like, oh no, I get it. I give you some examples. Um, I'm gonna talk about stories here. Um, stories you should all know, but your friends that didn't come tonight probably don't. But you know about Newton and the apple and gravity? And of course, Newton saw the apple fall and he goes, oh my god, I've discovered gravity. <laughs> um, gravity was there before. Um, Newton had been thinking about things like gravity. His epiphany was, and it wasn't an epiphany, it was, if the apple fell from the tree at that rate, what happens if it falls from a higher place? And how high, you know, if I, if, and this is the theory of gravity, then what happens if I go to any arbitrary height, you know, when does gravity stop? So this whole, you know, it wasn't just like, oh my god, gravity. It's like it made him think about something and discover the adjacent possible. That's an example there. Other one is, um, uh, here's another one probably no better, but not from this picture you won't, but Archimedes in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. You know this story? Eureka. Eureka. Yeah, Eureka. And again, it wasn't like he's goes gets in the bathroom and goes, oh, no, no. He was trying to solve a problem. And this is the way I solve problems all the time. Not in the bathtub, sometimes in the shower. Um, you work on a problem, work on a problem, don't know how to solve it, don't know how to solve it. A couple things happened here. One was Archimedes stopped thinking about the problem. And how many times have you solved that really hard, you, you struggled, where I'm late, oh God, it's nine o'clock, I've told it work, oh God. Oh, I, I was this close to solving it. Finally, you give up and you go home and you solve it when you're like five minutes out of the garage. Like, oh my God, I got it right. Or you lay down for bed and you go, and when we go, oh, I know what to do. I swear I saw at least half my half the things I really ran into that. I was like, oh, I have something else to try. And the, the trick is, for us with dogged endurance, is to say, but it's okay, I'm gonna go to sleep, the problem will still be there in the morning. I wanna get up and go, ah, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you ready? Let me go into my book frenzy to kind of be near the home stretch here. 
Um, uh, anybody read, and I'll ask this question, and I'll, 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 we'll see how much I make money. Anybody read the Lean Startup? Keith, not even you? So um, I'll give you my review. It's a great book about the power of iteration. Um, the author comes across as a little pompous for me. Um, that could just be me. But I love what he has to say, so I'm not going to hold that against him. I have a lot of people in my life like that. Uh, recording. Um, <laughs> so the big thing there is you iterate to get value. You learn from that iteration of value. And when we try and uh, come up with new ideas, it's important to try. Don't try and solve this huge problem. Um, when you have, when you come up with the problem you want to solve, like this is a problem. I want to solve this. I find more luck, and I see an example, more examples of good innovation. You solve part of it. Then you get some learning. And you go. Maybe this can be solved in a whole different way. So what really rung home for me is this quote that you know the unit of progress is validated learning. I you know that's, I want to get that as often as possible. Um, so do you know where I, you know where we're talking about where ideas come from? Other ideas. Do you know how to get good ideas from bad ideas? ideas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Linus Pauling says, and this is again fantastic quote. Not, this is not yeah, Linus Pauling, um, the physicist, right? Is he living in Portland? Chemist. Chemist. Vitamin C. One of those S's. Yes. Um, the way to get good ideas to see, I'm just horrible. I should not talk about facts or stories or anything because I screw them up. Um, once I talked about Richard Feynman, and I meant to say Los Alamos framework. I said Los Altos, which is a whole different place. <laughs> I do stuff like that. So the way to get good ideas is to get a whole bunch of ideas and throw away the bad ones. We forget that. It's really important. Um, so where do you find time to innovate? Um, Google has their 20% time, which is, eh. If you talk to the guys behind the scenes, yeah, it's 20% time as long as it's beyond your 100% work. <laughs> um, so more sustainable things uh, is I saw Atlassian. They used to have this thing called FedEx Day, but I think FedEx got mad at them because they changed it to Ship It Day. And they called it FedEx Day because it's 24 hours, it has to be there overnight. They would take once a quarter, take a 24 hour period, just like a Thursday morning, people would pitch some ideas. Um, they'd have till Friday afternoon just to be able to do whatever they wanted with it. It could be, the idea could be a new test harness, it could be to fix a bunch of bugs, it could be to get a bunch of testers together for a focused exploratory session, it could be anything like that, did it for 24 hours, they came back and did a demo at the end. It's kind of like a, you know, anybody doing, uh, like Scrum doing sprints? This is like a 24 hour sprint. Do demos at the end. Um, a cool idea. I've done that on one team at Microsoft, it was awesome. It worked out really, really well. Uh, I will do it on this team as well once um, we're a little busy right now, but we'll get there. So there's always time. And often we think, well, I'll do things the, uh, I saw your point, I don't know if I missed something. No, I, uh, I just uh, had something to add to this. Sure, go ahead. So, I place, help place I'm working right now, um, they're doing Agile, so they're working in sprints. They introduced a concept they called the sprint battle. <laughs> so every so many sprints, one of the people on the team gets to take it off and work on some oh. other thing. So, you know, how often you do it will depend upon you know how much of that time your company wants to give away, but it enforces that fixed duration That's cool. of stuff. And then at the end of it, they there's a company meeting every Friday afternoon. And part of that company meeting is people doing the reports from their sprint articles, doing presentations on sprint what they did and, and how it worked. So yeah, I thought it was really cool. It's the first company I've run across this. Yeah, and I like the idea of doing that. If there's across, if it's across different scrum teams being able to collaborate, I like the idea of being able to work. I like working with others. It's one of those cases where um, I really think people working with me is much, much smarter than me. I haven't heard of them doing that, but I'm sure you could. Yeah, you could. And again, you could experiment with that. Find a way to find time to look at those things. Every team has something you're doing because clearly we've always done it, or you're beating your head against the wall. And just try and solve a little part of that problem. And even if you don't solve it in the way you thought you would, you, you'll you learn something. And you know, uh, one more cliche example, I'm sorry, I only know the popular stories. Um, the, 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 the stick it note, you know, it was uh, a couple aspects of innovation there. One was a slow hunch, 
I mean, that someone was trying to invent a new kind of glue, so this glue kind of sucks. Um, I'm gonna keep it on the back burner here. Someone went, I need a, something to make a bookmark out of. How about that guy's crummy glue? This works pretty well, and it was around for a while, they couldn't figure out how to market it, and they gave some away, and then now posters are everywhere. Um, this idea of the slow hunch letting stuff stew. You know the story of Tim Berners-Lee? I should ask, does anybody in here know who Tim Berners-Lee is? Mm -hmm. All right, the inventor of the World Wide Web, or, or of hypertext. Um, it's an idea he stewed on for 10 years. It's like, ah, uh, yeah, it wasn't part of his day job, but it maybe could have gone a little bit faster, but don't be afraid to let stuff kind of uh, churn and burn. Um, let me see, I talked about test ideas, they come from uh, collaboration of the people. This next slide is uh, for the people who aren't in here. Well, let me ask a question first. I already know one way you try and get new testing ideas is that you come to meetings like this. How else do you get new testing ideas? Reading articles. Reading articles, good. Like, and here's the important thing. You just said articles, but did you mean testing articles? <coughs> good, and that is the answer that I wanted you to, to doubt me there. Um, Good ideas come from all over the place. I subscribe to a magazine called Science News, which is this little teeny pamphlet that comes out twice a month, it's every week. I have found more ideas for testing in there than any testing magazine or book. Not directly, but they make me think of things. They're like, oh, here's a different way to think of things. Um, so read anything. Get some ideas, and I, I don't mean Yes, is that my five minute or my zero minute? Oh, I have or a question, questions. okay. I wanted to ask you something else out there. Um, I found talking to people who don't know tech to be a great way to get ideas, or we're not people who don't know yeah. what, you're, what you're talking about. And have I, to ask a million dumb, dumb questions. Yeah, because what you'll find, and that's really good, talk to anybody. What you'll find if you just read testing articles, these are good articles that were just as applicable today as they were 10 years ago. Uh, often, and sometimes they will. In fact, I have somebody, you know, you've heard me at the beginning kind of bitch about uh, some of the testing talks we see today are the same ones that were given 10 years ago. Someone tried to call me out on that. They said, um, they actually made my point, I think. They said, um, well, that's true, but I go to these talks anyway, and I get new ideas, and I think of different ways, or I challenge them, and that helps me think of new testing ideas. And that's the important thing, is that the ideas come from other ideas. I just want to see the culmination, not the root cause. Um, <clears throat> as far as testing ideas go, places like this, Sasquatch, uh, Twitter, lots of testers tweet. Um, there's forums, there's user, group, user groups, there's uh, you know, software testing club, um, tons of places online for testing ideas. And you're gonna find ideas you like, ideas you don't, you can learn from both. Um, anybody uh, read the Gary Panter cartoons? I find quotes everywhere, which are great. Um, I'll read it out loud. If you have one person you're influenced by, everyone will say you're the next whoever. But if you rip off a hundred people, everyone will say you're so original. <laughs> so to me, this says, based on everything about you know, ideas come from ideas, is if you want to be original, you know, pull in ideas from a hundred people and figure out how to combine them into something new. There's always new stuff out there. Um, Einstein saw him before back again. Let me talk about some of my favorite books uh, just for a second of where most of this talk came from. Uh, the Steel Like an Artist is my favorite. I actually follow Austin on Twitter as well. Um, fantastic book on creativity. Not about testing. The book is not about testing. It's a great book. In fact, none of these books are about testing. There's a couple about thinking. Uh, the They All Laughed book is a book about inventions and how they were fake inventions, and the slides will be on, on, on the website too. Um, Scott Burke is Myths of Innovation. Um, I steal a lot from uh, the Canonical Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. Um, and I gave a precursor to this talk, which you can watch afterwards. It's kind of like watching Star Wars out of order, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's still, you know, We'll save The Hobbit till after. Uh, <laughs> I gave a talk on YouTube for uh, called Where Testing Ideas Come From, which was a pure ripoff of Stephen Johnson, um, translating some of his work into how I related it to testing. Um, that one wasn't the combining 100 ideas. It was a straight ripoff. Um, and then uh, last but not least, there's uh, 
Uh, I wrote most of one of those in a chapter each from uh, two of those, so those are recommended for at least that. Um, and there's my stalking information. I expect to see at least two new followers tonight. <laughs> uh, and I guess we can hang out. I think it's, I timed this well, put it in my clock, I have like a minute left, so we can hang out and answer questions. Do you want to do questions now? What do you want to do? How about we do this? Thanks for letting me blab at you. Uh, happy to be here and uh, hope I can come again sometime. Do you want to do any you questions want, before we draw? Do you want to take questions? Or? Oh, we have all yeah. You have a business card. I'm, I'm hoping yeah. to got to him during the talk. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, Alan, thank you. Uh, one of the closer. most entertaining, I think, speaking of all, one of the most entertaining presenters you've ever had. Because I'm the most ill prepared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that usually helps. <laughs> That's how it goes. Um, we'll just keep the. Uh, the drawing thing going.